Darby Maru the Hollow has a near invincible body. When the executioner tries to behead him, the sword breaks. Not even leaving a mark on Gabi Moru's neck. When the inspector lady mentions he's a shinobi from Dwaga Kude who was raised to become a superhuman assassin, no wonder the blade broke. Gabi Maru then tells her that yes, the blade was so weak, he didn't even have to use ninjutsu. This makes her curious about ninjutsu. But Gabi Maru is not motivated enough to show it to her. The next day he's sentenced to execution by being burned at the cross. They struck him with a spear and then burn him. But the spear simply breaks, and his body can handle the fire just fine. The flames do burn his clothes though. So at night, when he's being inspected by the same woman again, he asks her for a change of clothes, but she's too serious and doesn't care about what Gabi Maru wants. She'd rather he continue telling her his story. In reply, Gabi Maru explains that his parents were killed by the village chief when he was born. He doesn't know the reason and doesn't care. He was raised as a shinobi and his job has always been to kill people as ordered. Even his arrest was pre-planned by the village chief. His fellow shinobi betrayed him because he had expressed his desire to leave the village. Come next day, Gabi Maru is supposed to be killed by dismemberment, but the balls collapse before they can tear off his legs. and everything so the Magister orders more balls. But then the Inspector Lady tells him that although he may say he doesn't want to live, he is still subconsciously resisting death. So she asks him a question which he didn't answer last night. Why did he want to leave the village? He goes on to say he was the strongest Janobi in the village. He married the chief daughter, but she was too good for him, and because of her kind nature, his senses were getting dull. That's why he wanted to leave her and the village altogether. He's Gabi Maru the Hollow. After all, he doesn't feel anything. During the night when the inspector lady is on her way, someone tells her that this may be her job, but she shouldn't get involved with Gabi Maru. He is a hollow, cold-blooded murderer who killed 20 men during the arrest. In fact, there's also a rumor circulating around that the shinobi of Lower Gaku have drunk the elixir of life. But the man's warning only makes her more curious about it. Next, Gabi Maru survived being boiled to death, so they take him somewhere inside. And this is where Gabi Maru learns that the lady he has been talking to is Sigiri Yamada Asayamon, and she's from the legendary clan of executioners, the Asayamon, and now she will personally behead him. Suddenly, Gabi Maru body tenses up and he dodges her slash because he knew it would be fatal. Turns out, he actually doesn't want to die. To help him understand this, Sijiri tells him that this is because of his attachment to his wife. We see a flashback, where Gabi Maru's wife tells him that he isn't an empty or hollow person. He isn't bothered by the scar on her face. And someone who blushes because of a kiss from his wife simply can't be a hollow person. In the present, the clashes between him and Sigiri continue. But when Gabi Maru finally recalls that the reason he wanted to leave the village was so that he and his wife could live a quiet, peaceful life together. Well, now what? Is there a way? Sigiri brings out an official pardon. That's from the Shogun himself. All of his past crimes will be dismissed. And he will be given protection from both the Magistrate and the Dwaga Kude village. But there's one condition that is to go and bring the elixir of life from the Shinsenko island across the sea. Many expeditions have been sent in the past, but whoever returned was no longer human. She asks Gabi Maru if he's willing to accept this offer. The magistrate and his guys who were also there take offense to this and attack. But Gabi Maru unleashes his ninjutsu nim parasitic blaze and burns them with his flames. He's 100% ready for the mission. Sigiri has a flashback where we see her father executing a storyteller. Even after he beheaded the storyteller and his neck fell to the ground, the storyteller still didn't quite realize that he had been cut and continued telling the story. But she's not like her father. The fear of taking a life makes her hesitate a little, and so she ends up causing pain for the people she executes. Gabi Maru and Sigiri go to Edo, where we learn that it's not Gabi Maru who is offered a pardon, since many other renowned criminals were also there, although they were wearing masks. The one sitting behind Gabi Maru was a kunoi kid named Yushuraha. She easily recognizes him despite them having never met each other, and also expresses her disappointment because he's smaller than she expected. 
Now even though this was her first time on the screen, I'm sure you guys can also tell she's going to be the best girl. The criminals aren't too fond of masks, so they get permission to take them off. And that's when they see the only human who returned alive from the expedition to that island. They see that the man's entire body is blooming with flowers. Out of the 60 men, he's the only survivor. When he returned, he was already ill and within days. And this is what happened to his body. The criminals were now not very sure about taking up this mission, since the participation was voluntary. One of them decides to leave, but he gets beheaded right away by another Asayamon. Here it's revealed that every single one of them will be accompanied by someone from the Asayamon clan. It's also revealed that they will have to produce their numbers. And in reply to this, someone named Shubei Aza starts killing others. Everyone acts, and within minutes, it's an all-out brawl to the death and they can't untie the ropes on their hands either. Here, the skilled criminals stand out. We're talking about the bandit king Shubayaza, the Kunoika Yujiroha, the dragon of the sword, Gantasu Saitamiya, the giant of bison Rokaruta, and probably the most dangerous, Gabi Maru, the hollow. But the retainers are confused because he's the only one not moving. Now Sagiri is overwhelmed by the death around her, so her senpai Aisen tells her that she's not suitable for this job. But when three criminals target her because she's supposedly a weak woman, she beheads them all once again, which makes her feel uncomfortable, even though she really shouldn't be feeling that way. When Gabi Maru tells the retainers that, of course, it's not okay to kill people and asks if there's another way to qualify, this makes Sigiri regain her composure. Finally, her feelings were validated. It's not okay to kill others, you got to live with the burden. As for Gabi Maru, the retainers ask criminals if they can kill him to qualify. This left Gabi Maru with no choice. <laughs> He horrifically and brutally murders them all and then stands there like a demon. Sigiri tears up. All this time what she really needed was the resolve to live with the fear and the burden that comes with taking lives. Now, only 10 criminals remained, and it was time for them to be sent to the island. On their way, Gabi Maru mentions how the chief of Dwaga Kude is immortal. He acquired some medicine from a distant land long ago. So we tell Sigiri that the elixir of life is definitely real, but he isn't sure if they'll find it on that island. Once there, Gabi Maru is told he can't even remove the ropes from his hands. Moments later, Gabi Maru is hit by an iron ball that sends him flying. When he gets up again, he tells Sigiri to look. They need some clarification. But what Gabi Maru was showing her is that this criminal Kian's hands were untied. So she confronts his Asayamon about it, and he tells her that she's too serious. A fight takes place between Kion and Gabi Maru. Kion wants to test all his weapons on Gabi Maru the Hollow, and Gabi Maru apparently has to keep his hand tied. All of Kion weapons break, and in the end Gabi Maru kills the criminals Kishu Yamada had to watch over but he doesn't care. In fact, this has all worked out for him, because now he can just leave the island. He beheads the corpse and is ready to leave with the guy's head. Sigiri tells him to be careful on his way back, but he gives an interesting reply. It's not him who has to be careful, it's her. He'll be leaving soon. While she doesn't even know what kind of moves the criminals in the Asayamon have made across the island, Gabi Maru took note of what the other Asayamon said especially about how if this set of criminals aren't able to bring the elixir, the shogun will send more, and this time there will be shinobi from Dwaga Kude. So, Gabi Maru attacks Sigiri once the other Asayamon is no longer there. Meanwhile, we see that the Asayamon was right. In just a few hours, there have been major developments. The Asayamon Aisen, the one who told Sigiri that she isn't suited for this job, gets killed by his prisoner Rokaruta. Shubayaza was getting strangled by another criminal, but he frees himself and kills the guy. The blonde woman who seduced her Asayamon for whatever reason ends up getting killed by him. Going back to Sigiri versus Gabi Maru, it's intense, but both of them just can't land a finishing blow, which is ridiculous for Gabi Maru because it's a sign of weakness. He breaks her blade and tells her to stop resisting. He will make it painless for her, but his wife appears and stops him from killing Sigiri. He's not an emotionless person, and he isn't hollow. Sigiri also realizes that there are layers to Gabi Maru persona. She starts putting the sword back in its sheath and tells him that he's not his old self anymore, which were the exact same words his wife once told him. Similarly, the criminal named Gantasu Saitamiya, the dragon of the sword, a powerful warrior with no fear, 
cuts off his left hand after getting stung by a butterfly. His Asayamon freaks out, but he explains that the butterflies have human faces. They are not from this world. The left hand he cut off immediately turns into tree bark. We see a flashback which explains how Gantasu Saitamiya the Blade Dragon got convicted when he was exchanging drinks with a daimyo. The daimyo told him that surely even he can't kill a real dragon. This hit a nerve. So he ruined the daimyo's place and ended up as a criminal. Back to the present. After cutting off his left arm, he and his Asayamon see a massive creepy face monster. Elsewhere, Garbi Maru and Sigiri are surrounded by similar monsters. He know that he shouldn't find an unknown enemy, but there was no time to waste. He uses his ninjutsu and starts killing them ruthlessly. Garbi Maru also subconsciously saves Sigiri. This causes him to be vulnerable for a moment. But conveniently, the Kunoiki, Yujuraha, appears with two Asayamon. One of them cuts the monster, and Yujuraha is impressed by how he killed almost all of them single-handedly. He, on the other hand, remembers his wife telling him that he should thank those who help him. So he says thanks, but follows it up with what are her intentions for approaching him. She gets close to him and tries to seduce him using her charm. But too bad Gabi Maru already has a wife. As for why she has to assay Amon accompanying her, it's because he fell for her seduction. That's why. But both Gabi Maru and Sigiri can see right through it. Okay, so Yujuraha and Gabi Maru form an alliance. She tries to hug him, but he pins her down again. Although this time she traps him in a leg lock and tells him to think realistically. They can always just dispose of each other after all. Until then he'll bring his strength to the table while she'll give them her knowledge. Apparently she experimented on that other criminal and already knows about the human face butterflies who turn your body into tree bark. Garbi Maru goes on to ask her why she wants to survive. In reply, she starts telling a long story, but we all know she's making it up. So she gives the real answer. She just doesn't want to die young. That's it. That's all. Sigiri, on the other hand, loses her strength and fates. Meanwhile, it turns out Shubei Aza is actually the Asayamon older brother. They had a hard life together. Parents were killed, left to fend for themselves. But through it all, Shubei was always able to adapt a new change. This was his strength. When the bandits attacked them, he talked his way into becoming their leader. When he got arrested, he told his brother to find a way to free him. And so his brother joined the Asayamon clan as a trainee, became an executioner, and was appointed to be a Shubei executioner, all within a single month. Now the two brothers are going to find the elixir of life and drink it for themselves. That was a great plan unruly family. When Sigiri wakes up, they have all relocated Gabi Maru is even preparing a meal for them. Sort of feels like she's the only serious one in the group. Anyway, after the group shares some ideas about what to do next, the other Asayamon Genji approaches Sigiri and tells her to leave the island. He'll handle her duties for her. To begin with, she was never fit to handle a mission like this in the first place. Plus, is she even capable of killing Gabi Maru if need be? Subsequently, Tenza and Nirugai try to leave the island. They're on good terms of each other. But this is where the truth of the matter slaps them in the face. They cannot leave. There are monsters, shipwrecks. And remember that Asayamon who mocked Sigiri and left the island? Well, he was there, on the verge of death. It was already too late for him. The flowers have already started coming out of his body. Nurigai wasn't even sure if she wanted to live. It's her fault that everyone in her village died. It's all because of her. If she hadn't told those cruel authorities the way to her village, everyone would still be alive. Be that as it may, Tenza and Nurigai return back to the island, and while she dries her clothes, Tenza is met with a shocking revelation. That guy is a girl. He gets all flustered and embarrassed while Nurigai enjoys his embarrassment. She even asks him to marry her. Once they're safe and out of the forest, they start studying the currents around the island to find a way out. Meanwhile, Genji is serious. He wants Sigiri to leave. But then suddenly Rokaruta, the giant, pops up out of nowhere and casually rips apart a piece of Genji's body. He's now fatally wounded and unable to get away. The man tells Sigiri to run, but of course she doesn't want Genji to stay behind and die. So she tries to help. But Rokaruta possesses a level of strength and speed that just flat out doesn't make sense. Garbi Maru enters the fight to protect Sigiri. He engages in mortal combat with Rokaruta, but try as he may, he just can't find a weakness. If I focus on the destruction he's causing, maybe I can find an opening. Quick hands, quick reflexes. My instincts tell me, if I try to block those punches, 
I'll die instantly. Which means... Neem Po. Stone Storm! As for Genji, now that he's on the verge of death, he understands what Sigeri is all about. She'll take the middle path between heart and reason. He hands her his blade, considering how Sigiri lost hers back during the fight with Garbi Maru, and she manages to slice Rokaruta's fingers. But that's obviously not enough. Even when Garbi Maru uses his acidic blaze, Mean Po Stone Storm, Acidic Blaze Mode! Mean Po Zephyr Weave, Acidic Blaze Mode! Mean Po Grand Crag, Acidic Blaze Mode! Mean Po Cloaked Up Thorns, Acidic Blaze Mode! Rokaruta is just too strong. Eventually, the entire jungle sit ablaze, and the giant starts having difficulties breathing. This makes him collapse and fall into the ground. And now, when it truly counts, Sigiri is able to finally perform a flawless execution. The fire was engulfing everything, so Sigiri and Gabi Maru fled. Better find their elixir as soon as possible. Or worse, things are going to happen. And with that, Genji dies. Then there's Shu Bayaza and his brother. All everyone's fighting for their lives. They see a couple of beauties making out. All naked and a literal hell paradise. What's doing on here? So Shubei and Tuma walk in on these two having fun. The blonde one is not amused and wonders how humans were able to make it so far into the island. This causes Shubei to be on guard because it means the couple having fun doesn't consider themselves humans. The pink-haired one is much more laid back than the blonde one. She even offers them a chance to join whatever they're doing before. But the blonde one tells her off and then shapeshifts into a man. He's angry with the other brothers for ruining a good moment. Meanwhile, Gabi Maru and the others notice a young girl. She tries to run away, but they pursue her and then realize that she has some unusual supernatural abilities. Not only that, her guardian is a literal talking tree. Talking Lord of the Rings status here. Gabi Maru and Yuzura Ha corner them which forces the tree guy into inviting them to their village. His name is Hoko. As for the little girl, her name is Mei. Hoko also tells the gang that he'll tell them of the elixir of life. Yuzuraha isn't very sure about accepting the invitation, but when Hoko reveals that there is an actual bath in the village, she's ready to go. And after some days on a dirty island infested with bugs, I don't blame her. They soon arrive at the village, it's not very flashy. Or maybe it is. The village is ruined. There aren't any residents except the tree and the girl, and Hoko explains that the village has been around for a thousand years. Gabi Maru insists that they start talking about the elixir of life, but Yushuraha wants to take her bath first. Well, who knew we'd be treated to a semi-hot spring episode in this anime? Definitely a bit of left turn. Yushuraha enjoys a relaxing bath. Gabi Maru is obviously quite annoyed. She asks him to join her, but he would never. Sigiri then joins her as well. It barely takes her a moment to relax. As for Gabi Maru and Senta, they give in to their primal urge to eat when Hoko offers them some fruits and food. Next there's the explanation about the village. They call it Kotaku. You see the island is divided into three regions. The shore and the forest are called Ishu. The village they're currently in is inside the region called Hojo, and about the elixir of life, it's located in the central region of the island called Hodai. Hodai is inhabited by godlike beings called Tensen. They're immortal. Going back to the Aza brothers, Yes, the ones they walked in on were tension to, making love to each other. They're easily defeated and then thrown into a pit so that they can turn into flowers and be good source of tan. Tan is what you would call the elixir of life. Next, Gabi Maru also takes a bath because Sigiri insists, and she herself helps wash Mei back. There are a few awkward moments. Mei is obviously a very reserved girl. But then Gabi Maru tells her not to be embarrassed about her scar. Sigiri counters him by saying it's a bit more complicated for women. But he disagrees and says that he knows a woman who has a much bigger scar but is still just as beautiful as she can be. And Mei's eyes say it all. She looks at Gabi Maru with eyes full of appreciation and respect. Sigiri also wonders that maybe Gabi Maru isn't a horrible person after all. The man himself, though, he realizes that there's no more time to waste. They must act fast. Moving on. Remember the Asayamon who's guarding Nurugai? The young girl who was pleased with him and asked him to marry her when they were finally out of this. Well, he starts recalling his early life, his poverty, the lack of love from his parents, his life on the streets, and how he was ultimately taken in by a man named Shonyamada Asayamon. He is the one who executed the courtesan when she tried to seduce and then had a go at him earlier in the series. Shon is blind, but he was able to see Tenza's potential. 
Back in the present Tenza and Yurigai continue searching for a current when they're interrupted by a Tenzin. This one has flame-colored hair and is easily able to shrug Tenza off. Tenza uses his max speed to slice the Tenza and even manages to sever his head. <laughs> But of course, as the story has been so far, Tenzin are immortal. They're easily able to regenerate. Things ain't looking so hot. Tenza and Yurigaya are in big trouble. Fortunately, Sean shows up and keeps them from getting killed. But despite being the one who trained Tenza, he isn't a match for Jujin either. And so when Jujin strikes again, Shona's throat is cut. This prompts Tenza to plunge forward and attack, but he ends up receiving a fatal blow. And it's over for Tenza, at least in his final moments. He requests his master, Sean, to take Nurugai and run. He understands the boy's request, picks up Nurugai, and runs. As for Nurugai, she cries her heart out. Tenza is going to die, and there's nothing they can do about it. Tenza envisions a good future and is killed by Jujin. Now Nurugai is genuinely angry with Sean, but he clarifies that it was his dying wish. So he simply chose to honor that. But make no mistake, they will definitely get their revenge. By this point, Gabi Maru is getting impatient. He needs the elixir of life, and he needs it right now. So he ignores everyone else and heads off alone towards the Hodai region. He reaches the temple and soon Jujin arrives. It's the same one who killed Tenza. Of course, Gabi Maru tries as hard as possible. Hmm? What did you do? Static blaze. Oops, I killed another one. didn't have any effect on it. What have I not tried? Come on, think! Wait, what's this feeling? What's happening to me? One pressure? No! The blast is reverberating through my entire body! It's a power I don't recognize. Blocking it is pointless. I have to dodge! Is there any way to win this? And we see an almost overwhelming display of his skills and techniques. But Jujin can always just regenerate. This causes Garbi Maru to go all in. He just doesn't stop and starts landing a disgusting number of attacks on Jujin. Before long, the attacks somehow start working. I'll return to her alive! Even if it costs me my eyes and nose! Even if it kills me! I just have to destroy it faster than it can heal! Impossible! It's human! And then Jujin evolves backwards. It turns into a large half-plant and half-human monster. Elegance leaves his body, and Jujin now attacks Garbi Maru like a monster. In response, Garbi Maru remembers his training and braces himself to launch his strongest Nimpo Hiboshi. But he couldn't do it. He couldn't kill the Tenzin, 
Mei shows up out of nowhere and rescues him before it's too late. Meanwhile, Hoko, Sigiri and the others decide to come to Hora in search of Mei and Gabimaru. At the same time inside the temple, we see seven Tensen. They meet, greet, and talk about the elixir. The one who got done dirty by Gabimaru gets verbally abused by the one who defeated the Aza brothers. Back to Hoko and the gang, he reveals that all the trees and plants around them were once human. Then there's Gabimaru. He soon opens his eyes and immediately puts on guard because right in front of his eyes are Gantasu Saitamiya and Fuki Amadra Sayamon. However, he's too weak to fight. So instead he explains his fight with the Tenzin, which catches their interest. So they all agree to team up. Subsequently, Senta tells the group that he believes that this island is not the real Shinsenkyo. The mixed of deities they have come across aren't gods either. Yeah, that's it. Senta concludes that everything on this island was made by someone, a human. Back to Gabi Maru. He asks Mei about the Tenzin because how else was she able to save him? As it turns out, she possesses Dao. So what is Dao? Right as this conversation is going on between Gabi, Maru and Mei, Hoko tells the others about Dao. It's essentially the flow of Kai, a combination of yin and yang if you will. Nurugai, on the other hand, wants Shon to teach her the way of the sword. He remains in Shu, but then a number of monsters attack them. By the way, what about the Aza brothers? You'll be pleased to know that they survive as well. Shubei drags Tuma out of that pit. It's a struggle, and once they're out, they have a doshi waiting for them. Now a doshi is different from the mindless Shoshin from the early episodes. They aren't immortal like Tennyson either. Shubei attacks him because of course he does, but it seems that the doshi isn't going down without the fight. Their associates incoming as well. However, despite receiving a deadly blow from doshi, a blow strong enough to permanently ruin a human Shubei recovers relatively quickly. It's hard to believe, but it does seem that Shubei somehow managed to acquire a regenerative ability as well. To be more precise, when he was in the pit of flowers, he gained the ability to regenerate. He also gained the ability to actually see Dao. That's why he's able to win against the Doshi. But he started to become kind of like a Tenzin. Meanwhile, Gabi Maru and Gantasu Saitamiya are also attacked by Soshin. They're in the middle of taking care of them. Mei tells them the secret is being both, both strong and weak. She's not very good at verbal communication, though. So all she says is the words strong and weak. There are two of them, and they're here to capture Mei. For whatever reason, he wants her to return to Horai. And by Horai, we mean the temple. Basically, the reason they seek to do that is because they need her so that they can do whatever the Tennyson were doing when the Aza brothers walked in on them. But she's definitely lawsuit levels of too young. So what the hell? Absolutely unforgivable. Gabi Maru protects her, but it's not a pleasant situation. How do they win against enemies that are so strong? Fuki helps relay Mei's vague words to them by explaining that the answer to Dao is to attain a balance between strength and weakness. That's right. The only way Gabi Maru can see Dosi's Dao is if he himself accepts his weak side. This is easier said than done for Gabi Maru, but he manages. He starts being able to see the Dao in the Doshi and finally succeeds in defeating them. Subsequently, Hoko and the others reach the gates of the temple. They're here in search of Gabi Maru and Mei and the Elixir of Life too. But it doesn't take long before a Tenzin interrupts them. Mudan tells them that Dao isn't an elixir. If humans consume it, they just turn into plants, which means that there's way more to the elixir of life than we initially thought. Mudan then overwhelms them with super fast movements, even when Yuzuraha uses their abilities to slash Mudan into pieces and then uses poison. All it takes is one or two moments before Mudan has already regenerated. It's hopeless. How do you even fight an opponent like this? But little by little, just as Gabi Maru start to figure things out, the group begins to get the hang of Dao as well. Sigiri, Senta, and Yuzuraha use their understanding of it to fight Mudan. And somehow, one way or the other, they actually manage to defeat this supposedly immortal opponent. But the Tenzin then turns into a massive flower and launches a projectile straight at Yuzuraha. She can't get out of the way in time. Fortunately, Senta sacrifices himself for the greater good of keeping the best girl alive. Immediately, Flower starts sprouting and it becomes clear that he's done. In his final moments, he imagines himself painting the picture of Yuzuraha. She's dancing whilst holding a parasol. The Tenzin monster then fires the same projectiles at Yuzuraha and Sigiri. Only this time Shon appears and saves them. Shon then asks Nurugai to quickly take care of the flowers that are blooming out of center. As he himself prepares to fight the Tenzin monster, he has already gotten a vague idea of Dao, and now he's going to test it. Even after the flowers are removed, Senna's condition doesn't improve. All it does is buy time. Hoko tells them that it's too late. This is where Yuzuraha stops his bleeding by applying a salve, while Shon plunges forward to fight the monster. 
Now Sigiria and New Rigai attack the Tenzin monster as well. They're doing this to distract it though, so that Sean can lend an actual fatal blow on the monster. It doesn't work either. Center is still kicking. So we suggest attacking the oval region as it would usually be the most vulnerable point considering how Tenzin is like a plant. Sean is too wounded, but somehow, he succeeds in landing that killing blow. As for Center, he dies in Yuzhira arms. He dies with a smile on his face. It looks like Siguri isn't too uptight anymore, because she proposes that from now on the criminals and the Asayamon will have to cooperate if they want to leave this island in one piece. They talk about it more and more. And during the conversation, Sean and Yuzhuraha asked Siguri about her relationship with Garbi Maru. What kind of person is he exactly? Yuzhuraha says that maybe Garbi Maru is being deceived. Maybe the chief of Dwagakude village has used a genjutsu on him. Maybe his wife doesn't even exist. That's all a lie, but there's no way. And around the same time Garbi Maru wakes up, he had collapsed because of the fight with the Doshi. He wakes up and it seems that he cannot remember the name or face of his wife. There you have it, folks. The first season ends on that cliffhanger. In my opinion, you should definitely see the anime and maybe even read the manga. 